And as you turn there, I'll share some announcements with you. You were handed a bulletin uh, coming in. And um, just want to read again uh, what the Lord has given us, our church mission and purpose. It's his church. Why are we still here on earth? What's our purpose? It's to glorify God by building people up in Christ. That's what we're doing this morning in his word, to send them out for Christ, to bring people to Christ. He wants people to come to know him as Lord and Savior. I want to encourage you to come on Wednesday night. Um, we've seen six uh, films on the way of the master and learning how to share our faith. Really good. Um, women's studies beginning on Tuesday, February 6th in about three weeks or so at 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday nights. The cost is $10 for the study book. Children's ministry is not provided. And please sign up at the back table. And those books have come in. They've been delivered. And you'll get a book, a notebook, a pen, and um, none of the answers. You'll have to look them up. And, and, uh, but my wife's very excited about that. Any questions, please see my better half, Laura. And um, let's see what else. Just a couple of mentions. Lord raised up a new ministry, helps ministry. Do you know when we moved in here, we had a work day, and we've had more than one. There was 50 men and women and young men and women here on that first work day, just doing all kinds of things. One of the gifts the Bible mentions that God gives to people in the body of Christ is the gift of helps, and he gives many people that gift, and it's a gift because it's so needed. There's so much help needed. And so um, it's not in the bulletin today. It will be next week. Dennis Woods is going to oversee the helps ministry, and I'm thinking next week we'll take some sign-ups, but if you have any questions, you can talk to Dennis, and we're going to allow the Lord to lead. But as we go up to the third floor, there will be a lot to do. And then as we go on in life, right, there's always things to do. Um, and so if you'd like to be part of a helps, an organized helps ministry where Dennis knows there's people he can call that say, this is happening right now and we need some help. And if you're available, you can help. Then see Dennis and we'll talk more about that. And again, we're asking the Lord to lead us and guide us how to do that. But it's going to be a blessing. We are also um, don't have anyone yet. Uh, but God wants to raise up a grounds ministry. Now that we have the third floor, we'll have that whole top. Um, as you come in on 101 and you see all the brush and the trees and out here and everything, and so we want it to look beautiful. So believe the Lord wants to raise up a grounds ministry. A couple of ministries that aren't in the bulletin right now, they will be next week. And on the back of your bulletin, ministries are listed and overseers are there. And one of the ministries God has raised up is Boys and Girls Clubs, and they go once a week after school into the public school, and we have adopted Mary Peacock Elementary School, and we have a team that goes in there once a week to talk about the Lord, share the gospel, and the kids stay after with the permission of their parents, and that's going really well. That will be on the back of the bulletin next week. Um, and we will have Matthew and Megan's name next to that ministry because they're overseeing children's ministry here so that if you have any questions and you want to get involved, you would go to them and ask them. And they would direct you from there. We also have a women's jail ministry where with the county jail, it's been ongoing for a while. A Bible study is given once a week in there um, by Lynn and our church here. And... Um, that will be on the back also, and next to that jail ministry will be my wife's name, Laura Henderson, and if you want to get involved in that, just go to Laura, and then she'll direct you from there. Now, one couple more things. If you've been watching Israel, we're praying for Israel, and we have been, and we have in the bulletin a place to encourage you to pray, but also if you would like to financially help that church in Jerusalem, which we can tell you is trustworthy, solid, um, a good place to help as they help 
the soldiers and the families that are there and the other churches. There is a website there or a link where if you, can, if you want to donate, you can. And that is completely between you and the Lord. And we don't know if you gave or not. With that in mind, here's something the Lord's doing. It'll be in the bulletin next week on February 23rd, which is a Friday next month. On a Friday night, right in here, we're going to have a one-hour concert um, called Stand with Israel Concert. One hour. And if you were here last summer, um, Irit, who's in Israel now, who's one of our worship leaders and is from Israel, and her dear friend, they, friend, they grew up together, Yael, they both sang um, up uh, when we were at the fairgrounds in Hebrew and English, and it's beautiful. It's glorious. It's so pretty. Um, I was talking to somebody recently, you know, when Jesus comes back and, and we live forever and ever and with him, what language are we all going to be speaking? And we don't know, but I think it very well could be Hebrew. And uh, because, you know, Jesus is Jewish, amen? And the Hebrew language is so beautiful, and it's God's language. So we'll probably all know every language there is, you know? automatically, which will be great. But what we're going to do that night, and I just want you to know now, and we'll keep announcing it, is it's a Stand With Israel concert to support them in that church in Jerusalem. What we're going to do is encourage you to come out for one hour and worship the Lord. It'll be mainly worship, some prayer, a 10-minute presentation by... Um, a godly minister about why we should spiritually support Israel with our prayer and our finances. And um, then on the way out, as you walk out, just like you walked in this morning and you were handed a bulletin, on the way out that night, we are not going to take an offering. Um, we don't take an offering during our services now. You know that. There's an agape box in the back between you and the Lord if you want to worship the Lord in your tithes and your offerings. And I uh, want to stop right now and thank those of you who are faithfully being led by the Holy Spirit to do that. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and so what we'll do is that same website that's in our bulletin that if you want to, on your own, you know, privately support that ministry in Israel when you get home or whatever, that's between you and the Lord and them, that same link will be on uh, just the information that we hand you as you leave that night, right? So that night you come for the concert. There will not be an offering taken. You'll just be given the same link that's already in our bulletin that has been there for months. And then you go home, and it's completely between you and the Lord, led by the Holy Spirit. And if you choose to give to that church led by the Holy Spirit in Israel, they're, you're probably never going to meet them, and they're not going to know who you are. We have nothing to do with what you do. We won't know who gives and who doesn't. In other words, we like that because it makes it completely about just you and the Lord led by the Holy Spirit, which everything is supposed to be. So we want to encourage you because then sometimes people will go, oh, they're going to pressure us for money that night. No, we're just going to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit, and we're just going to worship the Lord. So we're looking forward to it and want to encourage you to come. Last thing, if you'll silence your cell phones, please, this morning as we get into the Word. And this morning, um, and by the way, if you're not aware, uh, our river flooded in certain spots last night. My wife and daughters and granddaughters were coming home from Medford, and they said as they were driving, they looked over, and the river was at the height of the road. And that as they were driving, the river was traveling faster than the car. And they were afraid. They were scared, you know, respecting that river. And then when they got on 197, there were some places where it was flooded, and they barely got through. They were concerned they were going to stall. I looked last night, National Weather Service, right here, and they said the place to avoid was the bridge right here. <laughs> and South Bank that goes underneath it, completely flooded out. And they were thinking that the gravel and rock company over here was going to flood out. Top river level is 33 feet. Historical date to record is 
the highest it's been is 33.9, which means it's overflowing. And yesterday evening, it was at 33.9. We matched it. And so I share that with you because here we are this morning. Um, thank you for praying. A couple of people were on our prayer chain to pray for them, that their neighborhoods would be, you know, some people were trapped in their home. They couldn't get out and uh, that kind of a thing. Here's what we believe how the Lord, because I had one, um, uh, someone was wondering last night with that going on, are we still going to meet at church this morning? And my answer was, yes, we are. And so, because God can do anything, right? And it can change. Look what he did. Here we are. So to call it with that going on last night and say, oh, no, we're not going to meet, you know, you see? And you need to know that that's how we think the Lord thinks and is leading us. You keep going forward till you can't go forward anymore. And he makes it clear. So if you know that, then on times like that, you'll go, no, nope, we're going to keep on going unless, and we'll find out if we can. So there we go. Now, we're in Mark's gospel, 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 1. And we're going to learn this morning about Jesus riding in, in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem the week before he dies on the cross. And then he's going to uh, rise from the dead. Stories found in all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and we're in Mark this morning, tells it from the perspective of coming from Bethany. Now, for a moment, if you were in Jerusalem and you're there, and you go out the eastern gate of Jerusalem, the Kidron Valley is right there. Right across the Kidron Valley, think of three football fields, 300 yards away. That's not that far. You can see it is the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane is at the base of the Mount of Olives. So now think of um, 11 football fields, right? 1,100 yards is to the top of the Mount of Olives. So if you're coming out of Jerusalem, you're going to go through the Kidron Valley, 300 yards away is right, the Garden of Gethsemane. You're going to head up the Mount of Olives, and at the top, it's like, 1,100 yards away, like 11 football fields, you're going to go over the top, and about two miles walk away, about two miles, we would then hit Bethany, outside of Jerusalem, over the hill, and that's where Lazarus and Martha and Mary lived, and that's where Jesus used to stay. In our story this morning, that's where it begins, and the Lord is there with the disciples. It's the week before he dies on the cross, and you guys, at this point, um, Lazarus had died, and he was four days in the tomb, and Jesus was a distance away, and he got the message. He purposely waited. And when you died in Israel, because of the, the heat, they buried you the same day. And he had been in the tomb four days, and the stone was rolled in front of it. And the Lord had come, and he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Roll the stone away. Lazarus come forth, and he had raised. Now, can you imagine the stir that created. And Passover is happening, so the whole nation is funneling into Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and people are coming, and that happened. And so everybody's excited about Jesus. The leaders want to kill him, and so because he's controlling everything, he's God, he stays away from Jerusalem until he's ready and so what he's done now is he's come to Bethany. They made him a supper. Mary anointed him with the oil. And this morning, he and the disciples are coming, doing reverse of what we just talked about. Like you're not coming from Jerusalem, but I'm glad we already shared that. Imagine we're in Bethany with the disciples in Jesus, and now you're going to head towards Jerusalem. So you're coming the opposite way. And that's what's going on in our story Today, Now, normally, at that time, probably a couple hundred thousand people lived in Jerusalem. What would happen when the Passover came, right, that it would swell. Pilgrims would come from all over Israel and from other countries to celebrate. And um, in this particular Passover, it's estimated pretty close. And I'll, I'll share this with you, that... Normally, there's like 200,000 residents. Now, there's over 2 million people. 
So imagine if where we live here, you know, there's X amount of people, and now 10 times that amount of people are here where we live. What would that look like? And that's what it looked like there. Every place in Jerusalem would be filled, every home, every place where you could possibly set up a tent, right? And then in the fields and in, in the valleys and in the Kidron Valley and everywhere outside of Jerusalem, people would start coming and setting up camps. And it would overflow even, as we're talking today, it would overflow over um, the Mount of Olives into Bethany and like a little village called Bethphage. And we see that in our story today. And because people are going to travel in and they walk everywhere. And so just imagine just, you know, a lot, a lot of people. And, and it's just good to know that. 128 years ago in 1896, a man named C.J. Ellicott um, described, he wrote a book called Historical Lectures on the Life of Our Lord Jesus Christ, and he describes the appearance of Jerusalem and its vicinity at the season of Passover, and he says, all the open ground near the city and perhaps the sides of the very hill down which our Lord had recently passed were now probably being covered with the tents and temporarily erected structures of the gathering multitudes who even this early, a week before Passover, right, would have most likely found every available abode in the city completely full. And then he says, we're not left without some data of the actual amount of the gathered numbers of people as we have a calculation of Josephus. And Josephus, you guys, was a historical... Um, secular Jewish historian of that day, so he recorded, and on that particular Passover, the way they figure how many people is they knew how many, the number of lambs being sacrificed, and then figuring a very low estimate, you were to share a lamb with at least 10 people, so figuring on that, the number of lambs sacrificed at that Passover was 256,500 lambs. So if you just take a low estimate number of 10 people per lamb, you end up with 2,700,000 people there in Jerusalem and in the hills and surrounding. We get that picture, all the life, all the buzzing, and Jesus has been ministering for three years. And if you look in John's gospel, they're wondering and they're talking, is he going to come to the feast or not? Because we know the leaders want to kill him. So everyone's saying, is he going to come or not? And the leaders had, had said, if anyone sees him or knows where he is, let us know so that we can arrest him. And so you just have this excitement, this enthusiasm building, and everyone's wondering what's going to happen. So, um, so imagine, again, all those people everywhere. And then imagine, what does it look like? 275,000 or more sheep also having to be out in the fields beyond those people. And you just have a lot of life going on. And, you know, I'm just thinking right now, if you notice when Israel gets attacked in our lifetime, in our day, it's often on a feast day. And that has proven true in my lifetime that I've seen the major wars and attacks. It will be on a feast day because they are gathered, right? And, um, and they try to surprise them. Well, Mark 11, 1, it says, now when they, and this is Jesus and the disciples, drew near Jerusalem to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Now, remember, they're on the back side, the wilderness side of Jerusalem, and they're kind of come over the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem. So they're on the other side of the Mount of Olives. He sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, go into the village opposite you, and as soon as you've entered it, you'll find a colt tied on which no one has sat. Loose it and bring it. Did you ever ride a horse that's never been ridden before? I haven't. And, uh, but a colt tied. No one has sat on it, and he says, loose it and bring it. Now, Matthew tells the same story in Matthew chapter 21, and Jesus, Matthew has Jesus saying, go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them the two of them, and bring them to me. And so in putting the four stories together, we know it wasn't just 
a colt, like a baby that's old enough to be ridden now, but it's never been ridden. It's the mother also, and, and, the, and they bring them both. And uh, the Lord said, you'll find a donkey, the mother tied, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. So just stop. Isn't that beautiful? Just simple words when we see them in the word of God in the scriptures. Jesus says, bring them to me. What is it that he wants you and I to bring to him in your life? Bring it to me. It's beautiful. It's glorious. Bring them to me. It reminds us of the feeding of the 5,000, and we studied that already. In Matthew's account of the feeding of the 5,000, which was really about 25,000 people, because that was just 5,000 men, not counting women and children, and he multiplied five loaves and two fish. And if you remember, he sent the disciples out. They had nothing to eat and said, go do your best and see what you can find. And they found um, five loaves, and think of like a little bun, right? And the fish were like sardines. Five loaves, two fish, and he said, bring them here to me. And they placed them in his hands, and he blessed them and broke them. And after everyone was full, they could hardly even move. They picked up 12 baskets of fragments left over. And so in the same way, Jesus had told the disciples, bring them here to me. And now he's telling two of the disciples with the donkey and the colt, bring them to me. In verse 3, Mark 11, Jesus said, And if anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord has need of it, and immediately he will send it here. So they went their way and found the colt tied by the door outside on the street, and they loosed it. Look at those words, you guys, in verse 3. The Lord has need of it. In other words, if they ask you what you're doing, say that I have need of it. The Lord has need of it. So here's the question. Just to even think Jesus had a need. But you know, isn't it amazing how whatever he wants to do here on earth, he wants to cooperate with us and work with us and fill us and use us, and it's by the power of the Holy Spirit and him living his life in and through us. And so whatever his needs are and what he wants to do, he has us cooperate with all of that. And so I just wrote down here, what is his need today? And he's going to let us know that by his Holy Spirit and lead us. But see, the Lord already knew because he's God. So it says, they went their way and found the colt tied by the door in verse 4. Their way then, because they're doing what he said, is his way. How about you and I? You're going to go your way. I'm going to go my way. Is it his way? There's such joy and freedom and peace when it's his way. And, um, you know, same story in Matthew. Again, chapter 21. It says, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And we can just read that and go right by. But just stop for a minute. Matthew says that when he sent them, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. The words of this verse should describe us. Let me read them again, shouldn't they? So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. That should be us. Beautiful words. Luke tells the same story in Luke 19. He says, so those who were sent to disciples, we don't know which two, went their way and found it just as he had said to them. Well, of course you know they did, right? He said, as soon as you go in, immediately you're going to find it. And he even knew what they might ask and say. And so Luke says, they found it just as he had said to them. Isn't that beautiful? Stop. That is true of all God's word. Whatever he says in his word, he says he's coming back to take the church home to heaven. Will he do it? Yes, right? Find it just as he had said to them. Every part of God's word will be fulfilled. If you'll look with me, please, at verse 5. But some of those who stood there as they were doing it said to them, just like Jesus said, what are you doing, loosing the colt? And they spoke to them just as Jesus had commanded, so they let them go. Now, I can only think of two possibilities 
if you can think of another one, let me know after. But number one, this was already prearranged by our Lord Jesus with the owners, and he already had it set up, right? Or number two, because he's God and he knows everyone's heart, he knew that when he sent them, not prearranged, and they asked, he knew they would yield and say yes and say, it's for the Lord, take it, right? Which one is it? We don't know. Could be either one. Um, he might have known that when the question came and the time came, they would desire to meet his need, the Lord's need, and allow our Lord to use what belonged to them. If you look at verse 3, our Lord said immediately he will send it here. How beautiful. And again, if you look at verse 6, when it actually happened, it says, so they let them go. If you put those two together, Jesus saying immediately he'll send it, so they let them go. What a beautiful heart that is, whoever owned that mama and baby donkey. And may we have that same heart. Now, Matthew and his account, same story, says, all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. And this is Zechariah. And here's the prophecy written 500 years before that day when it's happening. Here it is, um, Zechariah 9.9. 9, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Some of us were talking before church um, one of the greatest proofs that the Bible is God's word, because people will question the Bible, well, hey, it's just another book, is fulfilled prophecy. Prophecy is history written in advance. God knows the beginning from the end, so he has his prophets, and there's hundreds of prophecies in the Bible. This one was written 500 years before the day Jesus is sending them to get the donkey and the colt. Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt and the foal of a donkey. No other religion has any writings or books that has prophes fulfilled prophecy, but the Bible was written over 2,000 years by 40 different authors, and it's just a unity. And then you have these hundreds of prophecies that are fulfilled like to the detail, and it proves the inspiration of God and that he's real and that we can trust this book, and it's our only rule of faith and practice. So you know what we see, you guys, is our Lord Jesus, he is deliberately setting the stage, and he is in complete control. So if you look at verse 7, it says, Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes on it, and he sat on it. Now, question. How did he get on the colt? In Luke's account, same story, it says, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they, the disciples, set Jesus on him, which means they lifted up the Lord Jesus to put him on when you put those two accounts together. So you guys, how beautiful, huh? They Lift it up, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's always what the Holy Spirit wants to do in your heart and mine and out there in the world. Now, remember, never been ridden, so this is an unbroken colt. It's still following its mother. And you and I know normally that's going to take some time to train and break in that colt. And yet, when the time came, that unbroken colt would willingly obey its creator. Right? Willingly obey. God's amazing. May we so willingly obey our creator. Well, look with me at verse 8. It says, and many spread their clothes on the road, and others cut down leafy branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then those who went before and those who followed, that means Jesus is right in the middle. That's his rightful place cried out saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you guys, they're quoting Psalm 118, written a thousand years earlier. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. They are intentionally all shouting and quoting Psalm 118 because it's a messianic psalm about Messiah. And they're saying this is Messiah, right? And so this is what's going on. 
And in verse 8, it says, and many spread their clothes on the road. Matthew says, a very great multitude. And um, so I'm going to read to you just a couple verses from Psalm 118, written 1,000 years earlier, 1,000 B.C. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, speaking of Jesus. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they're quoting this. And what are they saying in Mark? Hosanna. What does it say in Psalm 118? Save now. That's what Hosanna means. Save now. Now, Luke tells the same story, and, he, and when did this happen? He says, then as he, and he's with the disciples, right? Now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives. So remember, at the top, 1,100 yards away, they're coming from the backside. They're getting near that. It says, then as he was now drawing near to the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice, and again, Matthew, echoing what we just read in Mark, said, Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And you guys, the tense of the verb there in the Greek shows that they kept, they kept on crying out. Hosanna. Um, they kept on doing that. So... So again, how many people were there uh, in that whole area? So as they're now coming from Bethany, they're picking up. And you guys, there's a huge crowd on this side of the Mount of Olives heading towards Jerusalem. And um, Alfred Edersheim uh, wrote in 1883, he was a Jewish man, born again, a, a believer. And, and so he describes if, you, if we were with them and going and you're on the way, um, you leave Bethany, and he says, the road soon loses sight of Bethany, and it's still a rough but broad, well-defined mountain track, and it's winding over rock and loose stones. He says, and I picture it in my mind, right? There's a steep descending slope on the left, and then the sloping shoulder of all of it above on the right. There's the top. Fig trees below and above, here and there growing out of the rocky soil. And he says, somewhere here, the disciples who brought the colt must have met him and brought it to Jesus, and they put him on it. They were accompanied by many and immediately followed by more. So it's just growing and swelling. For, he says, as already stated, Bethphage, the village, formed almost part of Jerusalem, and during Easter week must have been crowded by pilgrims who could not find accommodation within the city walls. And the announcement that the disciples of Jesus had just fetched the beast of burden on which Jesus was about to enter Jerusalem must have quickly spread among the crowds which thronged the temple and city. As the two disciples, accompanied or immediately followed by the multitude, so imagine this crowd of people, brought the colt to Christ, two streams of people met, the one coming from the city of Jerusalem, and the other from Bethany. Okay, wait a minute. We're in Bethany with them, and we're heading towards Jerusalem, and we're coming near the top of the Mount of Olives to come over. Word has spread, and what's happened now is there's two huge multitudes going like this, and there's a multitude coming from Jerusalem as Jesus comes with the multitude from the other side of the Mount of Olives from Bethany, and they're going to meet right there. And that's what he's saying. And some believe that there could have been as many as 100,000 people involved in the triumphal entry. So if we just picture a few people on the road or a small crowd, I remember going to Anaheim Stadium down south, and I think when I was there the last time, unless they added more seats, it was like 52,000 or 54,000 people. So imagine two stadiums full of people, 100,000 people on both sides of the Lord, and he's in the middle, and he's riding lowly on the colt, and he's the Messiah. And they're all shouting. What would that sound like? 100,000 people or more at the top of their lungs, excited about Messiah, 
and praising God and crying out and continuing to cry out. The news that he's coming must have spread like wildfire. And this same man, Alfred Edersheim, says, we can imagine it all, how the fire would leap from heart to heart. It may have been just as the precise point of the road was reached where the city of David, Jerusalem, first suddenly emerges into view at the descent of the Mount of Olives that the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the works they had seen. You're going to see in a moment, though, what he says is as you're traveling, you and I have done this, you're hiking on a mountain road or whatever. Let's say there's a city. Do You know, the dome of the mosque, uh, is there now and the temple is no longer there, but it will be rebuilt soon. We know that according to God's word and he always does what he says. And so um, after the church is raptured, that will be rebuilt. But there was a tower, right? So you know how you're going somewhere and depending on, you go up and down and around and you see the tower and all of a sudden you catch a glimpse of the tower that's in Jerusalem and part of the city and that's that first glimpse. But then as you keep traveling, you turn now, and it all goes back down again, you know, up and down. That's the picture, and we know what that's like. Well, if you'll turn with me, hold your place there, and if you'll turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter 12, verse 12, let's read um, what John has to say. So that's John 12, 12. So we've already been seeing the viewpoint of Jesus and the disciples and this multitude coming from Bethany on the backside of the Mount of Olives. This is now the viewpoint of the people gathered in Jerusalem who have heard he's coming, and they're heading to meet them there. And that's what we pick up in John 12, 12. It says, the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and cried out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Again, quoting Psalm 118. Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. And here's Zechariah 9.9 9 again. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him. In other words, after he died and rose from the dead, they remembered, and that they had done these things to him. Verse 17, therefore the people who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of his tomb, in other words, when he, wrote, when he raised Lazarus from the dead, people that were there and saw it, bore witness for this reason, verse 18, the people also met him, this huge multitude coming from Jerusalem, because they had heard that he had done this sign. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, you see that you are accomplishing nothing. They're saying this to each other because they want to kill him. Look, the world has gone after him. So you guys, they cut down palm branches, and palm branches symbolized victory, joy, celebration and to carry palm branches as a symbol of triumphant homage or honor to a victor or a king and that is what they're doing palm trees grew on the mount of olives and on both sides of the road from bethany to jerusalem and they're crying out son of david that's a title for messiah hosanna means save now but you guys the crowds were not just shouting um, save us, they were saying, save us now. That's what Hosanna means, save now. But stop, because they're not seeking salvation, save now, from their sins. They're seeking, save us now, from the oppression of Rome. Defeat Rome, defeat the Roman army. Sit on your throne now, rule Israel. Oh, here it is, right? And that's what they're thinking. Luke tells us in the same story where it says many spread their clothes on the road. The meaning is they continued spreading as they went on. So imagine Jesus going forward. People are spreading their clothes on the road. And as, the, as he rides over them um, on the colt of the donkey, they pick them up again and they run ahead and they lay them down again. Kind of like 
royal carpet all the way in, and that's the meaning, and that's what's going on. And doing that expresses their submission to him, and symbolically, they're placing themselves under his feet as their king. But they're thinking he's coming to defeat the Romans, and he's going to be that kind of a king. But his first coming, he came, right, to save us from sin. But may we express our submission to him. May we place ourselves under and at his feet as our king as we picture him on the cross dying for our sins. But he's no longer there. He wants us to remember the cross every day, but he's risen and he's alive now. And you know, we'll get it when we get to the end of Mark's gospel. The day he rose from the dead, the women went to the tomb. The angel said he's risen, and they run out to go tell. And as they're running on the road, the risen Lord meets them, and they fall down at his feet, and they hold his feet. How glorious, right? And that's what we want to do in our heart. Now, interesting. Um, you know, do you remember until this day, the Lord had never allowed himself to be openly and publicly declared to be the Messiah, and he had never allowed that. Now he's riding into Jerusalem. You remember going back to the feeding of the 5,000 after that happened and 25,000 people got fed? You remember it said they wanted to come and in John's gospel, his account, they wanted to come and make him king. Jesus knew their thoughts, so he departed and hid himself because it wasn't time yet. So he never allowed himself yet to be publicly declared as Messiah. He wouldn't allow them to make king. Now he's orchestrating it, and he's riding in, and that's what's happening. Um, he's making a deliberate and open claim to be the Messiah, the king. And the greatest national folly of Israel was the rejection and crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Zechariah, the prophet, clearly saw that very clearly. And in chapters 9 through 14, that's when he said he'll come riding in. And he wrote that 500 years before. Zechariah was a priest and a prophet. And he saw Israel as he looked far ahead, 500 years before Jesus came. He saw Jesus riding in over the Mount of Olives, right? But you guys, he also wrote with great clarity about the days we're living in and the days that are still yet ahead in the future for us, this same prophet that said Jesus would ride in. Because in Zechariah 14, he saw Jesus clearly riding over the on the colt over the Mount of Olives. And you guys, do you know the rapture is going to happen? We're going to be caught up to heaven. There will be a tribulation period here for seven years on earth and then the second coming of Christ where we come back with him from heaven. And you mean the same prophet that could see clearly and wrote that Jesus would ride in over the Mount of Olives into Jerusalem also saw clearly that he would come again a second time um, after the rapture and whatever, yes, because Zechariah 14 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord begins with the rapture. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, second coming of Christ. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley, Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Now listen to this. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you, with him. Is that glorious? So the same prophet sees the second coming of Christ. That's going to happen after the rapture, after seven years of tribulation when we come back. We're going to come with him when he touches down. So he sees 500 years before the Lord rides over the Mount of Olives, and he writes it. That's history written in advance. And then he writes it when he comes in his second coming. The first place his feet touch on earth when he comes will be the Mount of Olives. It'll split in two. You guys, the greatest proof of the Bible is prophecy fulfilled. So look up, because he's coming back. Do you know, this week I was sitting in my living room in the morning, and I know you know what this is like. And I'm sitting and I'm looking out the front window. And I'm just looking out, right, having coffee, and it's early in the morning. But I realize, and you can be looking out at the grass or the trees or whatever, but then you realize there's something else there. 
And what it is, is because of the light, there's a reflection in the window of the back window behind me in the kitchen. In other words, the window's coming through the kitchen back there. I'm sitting with my back to the kitchen window, and I'm looking out the front window, but I can see, I can see what's outside, but I can also see the reflection in the front window of what's going on out the back window. And outside the back window, there's this small flock, if that's what you call it, of black birds, and they're kind of flying in a circle. But then I see them all of a sudden go that way, and I know they're coming around to the side of the house, and before you know it, I'm still looking out the front window, they're right in front of me. The same flock that I saw coming back there is in front. And so in a few moments, they're right in front of my eyes. And looking forward, I had seen what was coming before it happened. The Holy Spirit takes that gift of prophecy, and that's what he did in men of old. They lived looking at what was going on in their life. But the Holy Spirit, it's like they could see what's coming, and they wrote it down, describing it in detail. So somehow, some way, we'll have to ask him when we see him, Zechariah. Zechariah, how did that happen? What was that like? Did you actually see in your mind and whatever Jesus riding over on a donkey? And he might say, yes, right? And so that's prophecy. So the Lord knows exactly what he's heading into. And he's coming to give his life as a ransom to save us, right? Now, same story in Luke. As this is all going on, all of a sudden, some of the Pharisees, the leaders who want to kill him, call to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. In other words, they're calling you the son of David, the Messiah. Rebuke them. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. If they don't praise me, the stones will cry out. Why? Because God's word always comes to pass, and it had been written and prophesied that this was happening. When I was in Israel in 2013, they dropped us off at the end of the city of Jerusalem, and um, I didn't like it because it was tough. We hiked through the Kidron Valley and ended up at the Garden of Gethsemane, at that eastern gate, the Garden of Gethsemane, there's the Mount of Olives, exactly where the Lord would have gone riding into Jerusalem. We hiked that whole Kidron Valley. And on the way there, knowing this story, I picked up a rock. And so this is a rock from the Kidron Valley. And, uh, and it wasn't close. It was on the way there. And by the way, there was nobody else taking that hike. And it's not a tourist thing where all the tourists want to hike that long hike. But our group wanted to do that, and of course, I was last. But um, I picked up a bunch of rocks to give to family and people, and I kept one for myself, and this is it. And that's what it always reminds me of. And Jesus said, so this very rock, right? If they don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. Amen? And that's our Lord. He's God. He's almighty. Um, and then it says, as he drew near the city, he saw the city, and he wept over it saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this day, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden for, from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. So again, Alfred Edersheim says he believes, and it's very possible, you get a glimpse of the city, then it goes away, you're making your way there, that there's a point where you come up on a ledge and the whole city of Jerusalem, you turn and all of a sudden, whoa, there it is in all its glory before you, right? And it was at that point that the Lord wept. And when he wept at the tomb of Lazarus, it was like a still, quiet weeping. This is a loud lamenting. He was sobbing out loud because he had come to save, and he knew they were rejecting him. And he said, you did not know the day of your visitation. We were talking earlier, and we don't have time 
um, this morning. In the book of Daniel, Daniel prophesied 70 weeks for the nation of Israel. And they're not weeks of days like seven days in a week. They're weeks of years, seven years, seven, 70 weeks of years, right? And Sir Robert Anderson multiplied 360 days in the Jewish calendar by those 70 weeks of years, and you ended up with like 483,000 days or whatever it was. And he also said from the command to go forth and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah the Prince would be this much time, 62 weeks plus 7, which is 69 weeks. Well, that leaves one week left, right? Until Jesus would ride into Jerusalem, but then he'd be cut off, which means killed. He died on the cross. Well, he did the math, and he said, from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah, the prince, would be that many days. Well, when Israel was in uh, captivity, right, um, Nehemiah was a cupbearer of the king and Artaxerxes, and he wanted to go back and rebuild the walls, and he said, and we know the date that he gave the command to go. Go, go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. So Nehemiah went. And if you take that date and you take Daniel's prophecy and you add all those days, you end up on the calendar with April 6th, A.D. 32. And it's the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Here comes Messiah, the king, the prince. That's why he said you did not know the day of your visitation. You should have known. And that's the idea. And so God is amazing. He fulfills his word. And, um, but as we wind down, let me ask you this. Um, you didn't know the time of your visitation. Have you given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ yet? Are you going to heaven? Have your sins been forgiven and washed clean by his blood? And what we've been learning on Wednesday night is that we have to let go of this idea because it's false. It is not true that you consider yourself to be a good person. Everyone is going to say yes because we compare ourselves to others, right? What Scripture teaches is God's definition of good is perfect. And if we break one commandment, one sin, it's so terrible it will separate us from God forever. And so he came to die on the cross in our place and to pay our penalty for our sins. And by the way, all of us here have committed more than one sin. We have committed many, many sins. But you know what First Peter said? Here we are as believers, right? Well, the world's not happy when we tell them they need to repent and give their heart to the Lord. He says in First Peter 2, that when they speak against you and I as evildoers, let them, they may by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. And I don't know about you, but there's no believers out there when we share the Lord with them, or non-believers that don't know the Lord yet, that when we share the Lord with them, they glorify God. They go, oh, that's so wonderful, and you're so loving to share that with me. Thank you. I just give glory to God. They don't do that. No, they're angry or they resist. When he says they'll glorify God in the day of visitation, they hear the truth and they get saved. That's when they glorify God. They see Jesus living in and through you and I and our lives that match what we say, and they're drawn by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God to get saved, and in that day they get saved, they glorify God. And that is the day of their visitation. Here's Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And he says, you did not know the day of your visitation. That same Jesus rose from the dead, and he's in this room this morning. And he has a day of visitation for every person. And the day of visitation is the day of your salvation. And we glorify God. Are you here this morning? And is today your day of visitation? And you need to believe in him. You need to believe he's God. He died for you. You cannot be good enough. And if you're holding on that right now, you better let go. Because there's heaven, 
and there's hell. And to go to heaven, we have to be forgiven of all of our sins. If we're not, and we're trusting in our own goodness, then we're going to be separated forever in hell because he came and paid the price for our sins. John the Baptist <laughs> came and he said, there's one coming after me, and he's speaking about Jesus, who's greater than I. I'm baptizing you with water. Baptizing means to be fully immersed in something. Like when we baptize you at the river this summer, June 1st or June 2nd, all the way under the water. It means to be fully immersed. He says Jesus is coming. And that's when he was coming on earth to preach. And he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I want to ask you, which one is it? Because it's going to be either one. Is that what he was talking about? He said, Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Then he said, I baptize you with water, but Jesus is coming. He'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Then he says, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. That's believers, the wheat. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So what I'm trying to tell you is when he says... Jesus is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. It's either one or the other. Like a sandwich, bread, in Holy Spirit and fire. Before that is the fire of judgment and the lake of fire. And after that is the fire of judgment. Wouldn't that determine the context that when he says he's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire, that every person's going to be immersed in either one? And when you give your heart to the Lord, and I do, the Holy Spirit comes to live within us, and, and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And at the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20, I saw a great white throne and him, Jesus, who sat on it, and I saw the dead, small and great. And these are those who did not receive Jesus. And he says, standing before God, now listen, books were opened. S on the end, plural. Books were opened. I saw the dead, small and great, standing me for God, and books, plural, were opened. Now listen, and another book, singular, just one, was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead, those who didn't know the Lord, were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books, plural, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book, singular, which is the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Here's what I'm telling you. If you don't give your heart to Jesus and you think you're going to be good enough to make it on your own, every single sin a person has ever committed will still be upon them and they'll stand before the Lord. And it's books, plural, because if you take all the people that don't know the Lord yet and every sin that they've ever committed, that's going to be a whole lot of sin. It's going to take a whole lot of books, right? But those who give their heart to the Lord are written in the Lamb's book of life and it says the book, singular. Don't need a lot of books. Book, singular. Why? Because all our sins have been forgiven and washed away. And there's only one thing in the book, and that is our name, because we're saved. So which is it? Because he came to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we are either going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and saved because we believe he died on the cross and he rose again, and we're giving our life to him, or we will be baptized in eternal judgment and fire when he casts us into the lake of fire. A lake is a lake, immersed, baptized, fully under. Which is it? Filled with the Spirit of God and saved or separated from God forever and baptized in fire. So we're going to worship the Lord. If you're here right now, the girls are going to come up and they're going to sing um, 
a couple of songs, okay, to close this. And while you're sitting right there, I'm not going to ask you to come up, raise your hand, come forward. No one will know. You quietly sit there because the risen God, Jesus, is here. And if you want to be saved, and you say, I don't know. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. I want to give my life to him. I want to believe in him right now. Then during this worship, you pray to him, well, how do I do that? The same way you talk to the person next to you and you tell him what's in your heart. Lord, I want you. You just tell him, I believe in you. I want to go to heaven. He'll enter in if you're sincere. Last question. Where are our sins? Only our names written in the Lamb Book of Life as believers. Where are they? Right? Singular book. First John says they're forgiven. Jeremiah says they are cleansed and pardoned. Micah says they're cast into the depths of the sea. Psalm 103 says they're removed as far as the east is from the west from us. Isaiah says they are blotted out as a thick cloud. He says again, Isaiah, they're cast behind God's back. Jeremiah says they're remembered against his soul no more. You guys, they're gone. Our sins are gone. And that's why in 2 Corinthians 5, God says, for he made him, Jesus, who know no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So, Hosanna. Amen? Hosanna, save now. Still the same Lord, the same yesterday, and to, today, and forever. He wants to save now this morning. If you're not sure, you pray to him right now. And you give your heart to him and make sure you're right with God. And so girls, come on up as we pray. And they're going to lead us in worship. Lord, we live to each other. And Lord, we just want to worship you now. Lord, as the multitudes were praising you, riding in. Lord, we want to praise you now. For you are here in our midst, risen Lord. And so we sing these words and these songs to you, Lord. And right now, Lord, help us to focus our thoughts on you. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's worship him.